as you can tell by the screen that we're going to be talking about today of how you can profit from Obamacare and the medical billing business. Again, as you can see here, uh, my name is Eric Ojea, I'm the Director of Research and Development here at American Business Systems, and we'll discuss a little bit about what I do there and, and some of the things that we are doing in the research and development. But first of all, and really want to get to about who we are, who, who is American Business Systems? And uh, we have, just like for the last 20 years, been working folk, with folks just like yourself, uh, wanting to work from home, very specifically in the medical billing business. So that's what we hope to help you uh, understand today. Part of that understanding is knowing about our website at absystems.com. You'll see that through here you can uh, look at who's about us and our business package at, and even look at this part right here where it says about income potential. But more importantly, if you'll go to this big orange button right here or the one that's right above it up here in the right hand corner, click on that and that will get you uh, into what's called our virtual brochure. That's a request to get into this particular section. And what you're going to want to do here, you're going to want to go through each one of these sections as you see here on screen. The opportunity, the getting clients, the training, the support, the technology. And once you've done all of your due diligence and you want to download the purchase agreement, then you're going to want to find that here in the final step. So be sure that you go through our virtual brochure. Many people have asked about whether we have any ratings with the Better Business Bureau, and we do. We certainly have it right here. You can certainly go to the Fort Worth Better Business Bureau and check out our rating there as an A-plus rating. Uh, and for those that are interested in this business and would like just more of a personal contact, you're more than welcome to come by and visit us here at, AB, at, at, at American Business Systems Corporate Headquarters. Now, we're located just north of Fort Worth in a community called Keller. As you can see here, we're at 5751 Kroger Drive. So please take some time if you want to come on by and visit with us. We'd love to have you here and really be able to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, this will certainly help you uh, as you continue to keep learning about the business. Our next training, our next live training workshop is October uh, the 28th through November the 1st. Folks, this will be here in no time flat. I was looking at the calendar here. We're already in the second day of October, and uh, this will be here in the next three and a half weeks. So, folks, if you're looking to get into this into medical billing and you want to know really how to do all of this, you really want to attend one of our training workshops. We've got this one here in October, and we have one more there in December. Now, let me introduce you to our founder and CEO of, of our company, of American Business Systems, this is Patrick Phillips, and Patrick has uh, is a author, and he has uh, authored the book on the left, "How to Reprogram Your Success Yourself for Success." Uh, you can pick up that book uh, on Amazon.com, uh, but the one on the right, he co-authored with a CPA on cash crunch to cash flow. These are the things and the issues that are not getting the doctors paid, and some of the things that we're going to be talking about today will cover that, but this book is really for you as a licensee of American Business Systems to help you build your business. He is not only just a, a book author, but he has authored several articles, and this one that some of you might already be in the business of medical billing already, this is BC Advantage. This is a, one, of the, one of the nation's largest uh, magazines concerning about billing and coding. And uh, Patrick was just uh, featured here on one of his articles, as I show you right here on this next screen here, on the bright future of medical billing companies. Uh, this is a great article, and if you'll stay towards the end of our webinar today, we're going to tell you how you can get a copy of this particular article that was featured there in BC Magazine. So we sure hopefully that you'll stick around towards the end here. So. Listen, without any further ado, let me bring Patrick on the line here and uh, have him maybe even pop on here with his uh, webcam. Patrick, it's good to have you here this afternoon. Okay, thank you, Eric. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, I thought I would uh, just kind of get started here by telling people that we're going to uh, be uh, talking to you throughout the entire webinar today about how you can get started in your own medical billing business, but at the same time, we're going to be encouraging you to do the research that you need to do on your own 
outside of this webinar. Now we have lots of resources for that. Like Eric said, at the end, we'll give you the phone number that you can contact your ABS rep. We've assigned somebody specifically to talk to you about the business and getting it started. And uh, they'll give you all the resources that we've got for people who want to you know, investigate on their own. So uh, let's get started, Eric. I'm going to just uh, turn my camera off for now live here, at least. Uh, there's a picture of us, uh, just in case you guys don't have a camera. Uh, of course, it doesn't record our live video during the uh, recording of the webinar, so we can just shut those off now, I guess. And uh, we'll go right to this topic for today that's pretty important. Uh, let me push a button here that's got, I got a sound going on in the background that's kind of giving me some reverb. Okay. So let's talk about how you can profit from Obamacare and medical billing. Uh, Eric, a lot of people are uh, under the impression that uh, these are two different things, Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act, they call it. Right. Yeah. Right. But uh, President Obama himself, of course, refers to the Affordable Care Act as Obamacare. It's just a shortcut way of uh, using, instead of using the whole name there, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act every time everybody just says Obamacare. Uh, in fact, sure. <laughs> we ran across a video out there that uh, I captured a screenshot here of it. You can find this on YouTube, even if you just type in Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, he's got a late night show where he actually went on on the street and interviewed some people and asked them, which which one do they like the best? And of course, they're the exact same thing, but uh, the it was just kind of humorous how some people would say that they preferred Obamacare over the Affordable Care Act and vice versa. So we just want to make it clear, folks, that we're we're using that term respectfully. Uh, we don't have any uh, political views on whether or not the Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act is actually something that is uh, needed in America. We know that Americans need health insurance coverage, and so we're uh, we're agnostic when it comes to that uh, that argument. What we want to do is decide whether or not it's profitable for you to get into the business of medical billing. Uh, with this Obamacare now uh, kicking into uh, uh, place as of yesterday. In fact, people can go sign up at uh, healthcare.gov uh, and, and, and get on one of the uh, exchanges that they have out there for getting involved in it. Now, I, I took this screenshot here because if you'll just go out to Google and type in Obamacare in the medical billing industry, you will see that we, uh, American business systems, are you know right there on the front page several times. Uh, because we have addressed this issue uh, for the last two years at least. Right, Eric? I guess that, maybe correct. before that. Yeah, because, there, Patrick, there's so many people that are on the call either today or, or are actually going to be listening to the call a little bit later and really wanting to know whether this, whether Obamacare or, again, what's called the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, how that's really going to affect medical billing. And, you know, my... From our research, Patrick, we know that really what Obamacare is going to do or the Affordable Care Act is going to do is actually inject more patients in going to see the doctor. So that's, I know that's what we're going to be addressing today. But again, folks, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, uh, and as you can see here that Patrick has up on the screen, uh, we've done our research and we're really one of the only companies out there that's actually addressing the entire issue. Uh, and how it relates to medical billing. Yeah, I found this uh, chart on a website that was actually trying to explain how the new uh, healthcare system is actually going to work. And when I first saw this, Eric, I, I kind of thought it was a joke. I, I couldn't believe it was this involved. But this is an actual chart that uh, the government came up with to kind of show people how that, uh, you know, the new healthcare system is going to tie in with the, the current healthcare system through the right. Secretary of Health and Human Services. And uh, it's 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 just illustrates that it's more complicated than most people even imagine that it is. I haven't read the whole uh, what two thousand pages of the Obamacare Act, uh, but uh, I know it's very involved. In fact, uh, you can get this book on Amazon.com or at any major bookstore right now called the Obamacare Survival Guide, and it's kind of like one of those uh, you've seen those books, the dummy books, you know, for learning different software programs. Well, I guess this is the dummy book for uh, people who want to get it down to, you know, where we can understand it in plain language. So it, it's a good resource for you folks who don't really uh, know how to research it uh, and don't want to read the whole, you know, the whole uh, ACA plan. So I kind of created this chart here just to illustrate folks how this will affect the revenue cycle 
uh, not just the doctor's revenue cycle, but yours as you begin a medical billing business. Uh, it starts up here at the top. We know that there's going to be more patients. We'll illustrate that here in just a moment, which means that there will be more visits to the doctor. That will generate more claims, of course, which will generate more revenue for the doctor and more billing for you, uh, since you'll be processing those claims for the doctor. That gives you, of course, more profits for you as a business owner, and that gives you more time, of course, to uh, work with the doctor and help the doctor and his staff see more patients. So it's a good thing. And what we're trying to illustrate today, folks, is that we have a very optimistic outlook for our business. That's why more and more people, I think, are coming down here to our live training workshops. Don't you, Eric? That's oh, absolutely uh, one of the absolutely. reasons. Right. And, and we've got uh, folks that are coming to this business that uh, clearly see the advantage. And I think some of the things that you're going to show here today as well, uh, starting right with this first one, will there be more patients under Obamacare? Let's start right there. Yeah. And, and so we did some research out on the internet, uh, found this, uh, this was just uh, back in uh, uh, September uh, here recently, just a few days ago. Uh, and, and it's talking about a particular uh, hospital health center in Maryland. And uh, notice that it says that this is something that they're going to be grappling with. Uh, I like that term because what happens is, oops, I think I want to hit a slide there. <laughs> there we go. Uh, it says that um, there is going to be next year, uh, it, it's, it's staff and hours in anticipation of next year's rush of newly insured patients, many with chronic medical conditions that have gone untreated for years. So if you think about it, all those people who have not had insurance over the past few years that can now have insurance means that they're now going to go to the doctor probably because they haven't been going to the doctor because they had to pay for it out of their own pocket and just couldn't afford uh, any kind of health care at all. And in fact, in this article, there's a quote there about the Lawrence Family Medicine Residency in Cleveland, Ohio, predicts as many as 90,000 new patients in Northeast Ohio for primary care practices. Right. Eric, that That's to huge. me... That, that, that indicates to me, if it's 90,000 in just that one city, just imagine right. what it is all over America. Right. And, and, and if the doctors are struggling currently with their load of claims that they're having to file right now, especially if they're doing this in their own office, uh, that's, this is going to be critical for them. This is, we're, hit, we're going to hit a critical mass here very quickly. Yeah, this article, for example, that I found just uh, yesterday, physicians prepare to deal with the increased demand and strain on the practices under Obamacare. So here's a quote, for example, from this doctor who says, we're about to get changes in coverage, but we don't have a ready way to say, here's another million family doctors. So there's a pipeline problem where it will be another five to 10 years where we're able to get the volume of doctors to take all of these patients. Now, folks, the reason that's good news for you as a medical billing company is because the doctors obviously need help, don't they? Help in uh, freeing up their time for them and their staff to be able to see all these new patients. And of course, that's where you come in. You're going to take away that burden that they have if they're doing their own billing in their own office you're going to take that away from them and free them up so that they don't have to worry about that as much. Uh, there's actually a shortage, in fact, of uh, primary care doctors in the United States, as this quote here shows uh, just recently from the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Boy, that's a that's an odd year there, isn't it? One, two, zero, one, three. <laughs> I got an extra one in there. But yeah. the point is... Uh, the facts are that the government, of course, folks, if they wanted to get involved in billing, they would have done that back in 1965. Uh, some people are worried about that. Oh, it's going to be a single payer system and the, the government's going to take all this over. No, somebody is still going to be billing. In fact, the largest providers of Medicare and Medicaid are two of the biggest commercial insurance companies that are out there, Aetna and Blue Cross Blue Shield. Right. So... Uh, I think this is the article that you uh, came up with, uh, Eric. Sorry, I didn't have time to retype it, but it blew up here kind of fuzzy. Um, it's just basically saying, uh, in fact, the title of it was kind of where we got the title for our webinar, How to Profit from Obamacare. And Correct. it says 
that October 1st is a big day. That was uh, yesterday. That's when the government subsidized health insurance exchanges set up under the Affordable Care Act are scheduled to go live. The government forecasts that 7 million Americans will seek benefits through these marketplaces. These companies can grow earnings 15% a year, even without the Medicaid expansion. Now, what they're talking about, folks, is these commercial insurance companies that I just mentioned. Uh, it's an enormous boom, it says, for health insurers that specialize in Medicaid and Medicare. So uh, the industry sees green. That to yeah, me is... This, this article, Patrick, was just um, September 28th, I believe. So we're talking just the last few days that this article just came out. And it is just yeah. unbelievable of uh, the, the growth that's happening with... Uh, all these insurers, because uh, Patrick, thinking about this, and I'm glad you brought this up on screen, people kind of get that um, that question in their mind, what happens if we go to a single payer? Well, folks, we're about to address that right now, that I don't think Blue Cross and Blue Shield is going to go anywhere, or Aetna, or United Healthcare, because look what Patrick's about to show you in these growth charts. We're talking about billions of dollars here that's going through these companies. Yeah, look at the stock prices uh, for Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, since 2009 when uh, Obamacare was introduced. It's it's going up. Uh, look, I can show you the same thing for United Healthcare. Look at that growth. Here's uh, Aetna. See, they're all on an upward grow. Now, folks, investors are smart enough to know that what this means for these insurance companies is they are going to be more profitable than they were under the old system. And they would not be investing in these companies if there wasn't a huge future for these companies providing what uh, is needed to cover the uninsured Americans. There's Cigna, uh, Humana. Uh, I think that's the last one. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that's why, folks, you don't have to worry about whether or not this industry is going to grow. Anytime you see charts like that, from the commercial carriers, uh, I tell people, look, look downtown at your biggest buildings in your town. Uh, those buildings are owned probably by insurance companies. And uh, Patrick, go right along with that. You know, certainly people are asking, is medical billing a viable career choice? And you know, there's no doubt that we say yes. Uh, but, you know, there's some things that you've got to understand, and we want to come out and right here in the beginning and just say uh, this is something that is not a get-rich-overnight uh, type of anything. Uh, it's, it's amazing that people still ask all of us, is this a, uh, a get-rich-quick scheme? No, this is, this is actual work. This is, uh, but it's, it's a great thing. Just like those charts that we saw, it's a continual growth. Uh, in your particular business. Uh, and, and again, I was just talking with someone just earlier um, about doctors, and they're not just so easily ready to hand over their money uh, to you just so quickly unless they can trust you to deal with their cash flow. So, Patrick, uh, let's address that just real quickly. I mean, uh, I mean, this, this, we're not just selling widgets here. Uh, for the doctors, we're really selling them and, and taking care of their solutions uh, again, and that's why you know we're dealing very specifically with the doctor's cash flow. Well, Eric, you're the one that actually came up with this illustration, and I think it's a wonderful way to help people wrap their brain around this, folks. Physicians are running two different businesses. One is the clinical side, where they're actually seeing patients and helping patients to get well. And the other side, of course, is the business side. That is, once they've seen the patient, they have to build the commercial insurance companies or the government agencies, in this case, Medicare and Medicaid, to pay for that visit. Uh, otherwise, they don't get paid. And so these are two separate things, two completely diverse types of businesses. The doctors are not trained in one of these. Can you guess which one? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's right. It's, it's the one on the right. It's the business side. In fact, Eric, isn't it true that people who come through our live training, we ask them this question, if they've, if they've worked for a doctor in the past, or in some cases, we have doctors who come through our training uh, that are looking to get out of the clinical side of medicine and, and into the, uh, the profitable billing side, and they'll say the same thing. 
that exactly. doctors yeah. are not the the they're not trained in business, so they're not the best business people. Now, I know that's a generic uh, uh, thing to say. There, there are doctors who are very smart, uh, very very smart when it comes to the business side, but I'd say that's uh, the rare case. <laughs> Well, and again, it's just kind of going back to that, that little brief thing you had there about talking about running two separate businesses there. Some doctors have already outsourced their billing, so they already know that. And, and the funny thing is, is that some of them will take that back into their office even knowing some of those things. So, yeah, it, they, the doctors need to stick with just dealing and, and seeing patients. Yeah, that's what they've been trained to do, and that's what their core competency is, so to speak. And then, of course, think about all the new patients that are going to be coming through to see the doctors. We mentioned that earlier. Uh, so uh, I, I illustrate this with this waiting room situation here, folks. This will be a light load for a doctor. Uh, if you think the, bill, the, the waiting rooms are full now uh, to see doctors, uh, wait till this thing really cranks up here within the first uh, six months or so. So... It really boils down to this. What, what does the future hold for medical billing companies? So I, I, I wanted to show a couple of things we ran across here just recently. Again, this is a, a, a September 9th article here from Money News, and it says uh, Obamacare, uh, Obamacare helps create startup firms. And uh, as shocking as that may seem to some people, it's actually going to benefit in a lot of ways uh, a business in America. One of those businesses, as you can see down here, it mentions, is medical billing specialists. It's going to help patients to see and deal with and have access to the medical billing specialists. Remember, folks, we train you to be the specialist. The doctor is not the medical billing specialist that they're talking about here. Uh, it's, it's people who've been trained to do the billing for doctors. Uh, here's another article. Uh, that just came out in May. Groups push for easy fixes to cut the doc's administrative burden. Now, I took this one out because it has a great quote here that re refers to the 83000 a year that doctors spend completing paperwork. That's the average, folks, that doctors are spending to complete the paperwork. Here's the exact quote. According to the TMA, which represents more than 47,000 physicians and medical students, each of its physicians spends nearly 83000 a year on administrative costs. Folks, that's primarily the billing for the patients. Uh, they routinely tell this group that they often stay at the office until 9 p.m. or later just to complete the paperwork. So by taking that burden off of the doctor and their staff, you're certainly freeing those doctors up uh, to do uh, things they'd rather be doing than completing paperwork there. Patrick, you still there? Yes, I uh, was just uh, going to let you All take right. this one and okay. <laughs> talk a little bit about it. Yeah, no, no problem. Well, anyway, on the healthcare spending, um, again, we've already shown the growth charts of what a lot of the health insurance companies are actually doing uh, and the growth and the money that's being spent here. And we're talking in these 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 terms, we're, and I believe we're talking in billions of dollars. So we're talking the, the growth that's happening in healthcare spending from 1960 up to 2020. So we're right in the middle between this 2010 and 2020. And folks, you can truly see what the projections are here on what's going to happen between uh, 2010, 2020, and just the spending alone. So again, we're sharing this information with you very uh, much in, in line with the, the growth of the charts that are happening with the insurance companies and their stocks that are growing. Uh, and folks, medical billing is just not going to go away. Promise you. Uh, Patrick, didn't you say once before that the government's already in uh, medical health care, but yet they're not doing the billing for that? I believe it's called Medicare. That's right. Well, look, it took from 1960 to 2010, what is that, 50 years uh, right. to get to where we're spending two uh, and a half uh, trillion dollars. Uh, we will almost double that in the next 10 years. All right. Uh, because of the and growth. We're right in the middle of that right now. I mean, we're, yeah. we're seeing such a growth here. And our folks, again, a lot of, uh, let me let me share this. If you haven't touched base with some of our licensees currently that are in the business and talking about their growth, sometimes that's some of the better people to talk with. And, and again, because we're just showing you what's happening in the industry. 
but to talk with some of those folks one on one, uh, the licensees that are just they're 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 seeing this type of growth. We encourage you to to uh, touch base with some of those folks. Yeah, we'll be glad to give you the name and uh, direct phone number of uh, any licensee across the country that has agreed to take phone calls for us. And there's a lot of those. Uh, you're welcome to talk to any of those people. Just ask your ABS rep about that. Uh, I've shown this book uh, here for the past year or so because I ran across this in the bookstore, uh, Prepare to Be a Millionaire. I couldn't help but pick it up. It said there's 43 millionaires in seven different industries uh, that tell you know how you can become a millionaire in the industry of your choice. Well, one of those industries uh, that this guy, Dan Newman, is in is what we teach people to do, and that's medical reimbursement for doctors. Uh, he calls himself a medical reimbursement specialist. And he says for the next 10 years, the medical industry is going to be the most wide open field. Every doctor, dentist, hospital, and clinic has trouble collecting money from the patients and the insurance companies. I believe that over the next decade, so much money will be made in this particular industry that it will blow you away. So folks, don't take uh, Eric and I's uh, word for any of this. Uh, do your own research, uh, and you'll find that what we're saying is true about the growth of this industry and, and what's about to, to happen. Uh, here's another article from uh, PRN Funding, LLC. They say that medical billing in the coding industry is predicted to boom by 2020. Uh, again, uh, statistics that you know we've given to you from credible sources that you can go out and research on your own and, and confirm these things. Here's another article that we just found, how Obamacare is changing health career fields. Uh, so one of the things that it does, of course, is uh, help certain fields in industry. Of course, you can imagine coding, for example, those are people who are wanting to be medical coders. Those people who want to do medical billing, though, look, it says right here, the 10 healthcare jobs most impacted by Obamacare, number one. Medical records and billing. <laughs> this is means, uh, as it says here, is potentially 30 million new patients uh, will need healthcare services. They'll need someone to keep track of all their billing records and billing. And of course, that means that you are right smack dab in the in the middle of all that growth. Uh, there's a 1900 a $19 billion dollar push to electronic medical records. By the way, which we'll show you here in a moment, you can have a, a big part in as well. Hey, then there's. Patrick, let me just I was going to, let me just jump in here real quickly and, and, and I see some questions that are coming in. Yeah. And I'm going to start monitoring some of these questions as Patrick's going through this. So I see that there's a few there and I'll interject some of those here in a moment. But folks, feel free to, uh, you'll see that little question uh, icon uh, up there in the right hand corner as well. So if you'd like to type in a question, feel free to do that. that that's uh, what we're here to do. So, okay, Patrick, keep good, going. Good. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I failed to mention that at the very beginning. Thank you, Eric. We need to, uh, address whatever questions you guys have as we go through all this. So Eric, just jump in there with any one of those anytime. Sure. There's a magazine called Medical Economics. You can subscribe to it online. This is from the April issue. And you'll notice that one of the charts they had in there is what is the future of independent small and solo practices in the primary care? Uh, well, as you can see, uh, more than half say uh, these were surveyed doctors. They said that there will always be a place for the small and solo practices. That is your target market. In our industry, folks, you don't want to go off after what we call the elephants, uh, the big groups that have you know, 40, 50, 60 doctors in them, uh, at least not at first. We do have licensees who've signed up some big groups, but that was after they've had some experience with the small and solo practices. And so if you're wondering if there is still a market for that out there, according to doctors, there will always be a place for that. In fact, Joseph Valenti here, he's the uh, a doctor himself and the board member of the Physicians Foundation says, one of the trends we're going to start seeing is all these doctors finding out that it's not as great as they thought that is uh, joining hospitals and so forth. And, and they will be leaving the hospitals and going back out to private practice. You hear that a lot here recently, haven't you, Eric, about uh, people concerned that the doctors are joining the big hospital groups and some well, of them exactly. are, of course. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Daryl, uh, just wrote a, a statement or a question and he says, I've heard reports that a lot of doctors are leaving their private practice and going to hospitals as employees. And I think we just sent out an article just this last week to some of our uh, folks uh, talking about uh, how that's, and this came from the AMA. The AMA says that it's, it's not what you think. And so, you know, the, the doctors are not necessarily wanting to become employees of hospitals. Let's put it that way. 
Well, in fact, Eric, here's a quote from this article that we were just looking at that says, at no time in medical history has there been a greater need for expertise, technology, compliance assistance, and so forth. There is simply no entity in existence positioned to meet these needs better than the third-party medical billing companies, folks. That's what you would be if, if you joined ABS as a licensee. When you go through our training, you become a third-party medical billing company. And here's a continuation of that. By leveraging the essential functionality with the potential value adds that are referred to above, the third-party medical billing industry can not only be an essential cog in the uh, Affordable Care Organization mechanism, but can also ensure that the Medicare healthcare providers have the time and the resources to concentrate on their real priority, providing health care to our aging population. Folks, that's the bottom line. You're going to free the doctors up to have the time to see all of these baby boomers that are retiring right now and all the uninsured Americans that are moving into the system. Free them up so that you can focus on the things uh, that help the doctor uh, get their money from the, those payers. Exactly. Well, this article came out by the HBMA, and HBMA, again, is one of those organizations that Earth Earth is doing with dealing with the, uh, directly with the government in healthcare billing and management. So that's, uh, that's what this is called. And uh, we're, we're part of, of HBMA because we like to keep up with what's going on through the lobbies and everything else, as you can see here. And uh, Patrick's got this article that just came out this last June, and Patrick, why don't you Talk about those highlighted points there of the future of uh, medical billing. Yeah, so so the Healthcare Billing and Management Association folks has a voice in Washington. They met with John Bloom. He is, as you can see right here, the principal deputy administrator and director of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And uh, here's that quote pulled right out. He says, perhaps most significant was a statement by Mr. Bloom made early in his response, indicating that he felt that despite all of the push for coordinated care and bundled payments and shared savings, fee-for-service payments would be around for a long time. Folks, what he's addressing specifically there for the HBMA, since they represent medical billers in America, he's saying that the fee-for-service payments, that's what you would bill directly to the commercial insurance uh, companies and the Medicare and Medicaid, they will be around for a long time. This is a long-term industry, folks. It's not a fad. It's not, uh, you know, here today and gone tomorrow, as many, many businesses are. It's been around for a long time since my wife and I started medical billing in 1987, in fact, here in Fort Worth. Uh, we have built this business to uh, a large level where we've actually helped hundreds of people nationwide start their own medical billing business. And it'll be around for a long time to come. Right. Well, and then, and then we answer a lot of the questions here about how you can help doctors with their cash crunch and, and folks this is what the doctors are uh, concerned about not only do they see a, a, a crunch very specifically with their cash flow they're just wondering now how can they get what they can because even a lot of the reimbursements are lower now Chad's asked a very long question Chad and I'm gonna let this uh, we're gonna turn that question over to your uh, the, your ABS rep that you're working with but just kind of hit the surface of everything we know that a lot of reimbursements are a lot lower, uh, and, and what our system will do, it will certainly help um, capture as much money as available uh, for those doctors. And one of the things that we talk about here in the Cash Crunch Cash Flow book is how we go about doing that. So, you know, the first thing that Patrick wants to talk about today, and one of the things that we deal with in the book is billing is not, again, the doctor's core competency. So, Patrick, let's kind of talk about that again real quickly. Yeah, and, and Chad, I, I do appreciate the fact that you've gotten given some real thought to this. Uh, and, and believe me, we get this question a lot that you've addressed about the high deductibles and so forth. But the fact is that the doctors need even more help. The less they are paid by the providers, the insurers, the more they need your help in collecting what they can collect from them because they are struggling. We, we've actually had licensees tell us they have, they've salvaged some doctors from going out of practice because of what they've done to help their cash flow. Some of it's primarily due to this thing that uh, Eric just mentioned. Billing is not a doctor's core competency. 
uh, and by the way, Chad, we'll also address your question about the uh, uh, the codes uh, here when we get into the coding section here in just a moment. So uh, it is true that billing is not the doctor's core competency. We know the core competency is seeing those cute little patients and helping them to get well. In fact, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine folks says that market analysts estimate that the, that 24 cents out of every dollar are wasted on administrative and billing expenses. Now, folks, in any business, when you take 24 cents out of every dollar that comes in uh, and spend that on some sort of paperwork, that's way, way too much. You, as a medical biller through American business systems, can charge the doctor as little as 5, 6, 7%. Uh, which, as you can see, is a whole lot less than 24% uh, out of every dollar. Uh, and that's because you're working at home. You're doing this billing for not just this one doctor, but for several doctors. And which means economy of scale makes you the specialist. You don't spend near as much time as the doctor staff has to spend to, to get those same dollars from those payers. We also address that doctors are seeing more patients and, and need their staff to help them in seeing and processing those patients. We mentioned that earlier, but uh, some people don't realize it, that the healthcare legislation will provide more people with access to care. Uh, the challenge is just getting enough primary care doctors to meet that patient demand. It's going to be one of the nice, Yeah, one of the nice things, Patrick, about our system is even though that uh, – this is going to help doctors, our, the solutions that we have that we even actually have listed in our the book there. Uh, this whole part about doctors needing to see more patients and need their staff to help them see and processing those patients, a lot of what we have in our iClaim system actually helps them uh, collect patient demographics or the patient's data directly from the insurance companies, saving them a lot of time and making sure that they can process those patients to get in to see the doctor and then ensure that that doctor's going to get paid whenever it's time for you as the medical billing company to actually process those claims. Yeah, because the bottom line, Eric, is uh, it's going to either, somebody's got to spend the time to figure out how to get that money paid uh, and those claims uh, through to the insurance companies. It's either going to be the doctor's staff uh, or right. it's going to be some specialist like yourself that's been trained to do that. And of course, number three is that doctors have trouble collecting money from patients and insurance companies. This is a big problem, folks. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how big it is. In fact, uh, here's a quote from McKinsey and Company that says, physicians typically collect only about 50% of the outstanding patient balances. That's the money that patients owe to the doctors. And that results in almost $60 billion in bad debt annually. We have a solution for all these things, folks. Uh, typically, in fact, medical offices have an average of 52 days outstanding on those patient balances. And more than 20% of their patient balances, um, you know, are 120 days out. What is that? Four months? That's, that's right. a long time to wait for your money in any business. Right. So we have uh, other services in addition to medical billing uh, that you'll be uh, able to offer to the doctors. One of them is called Choice Pay. And this is the one that actually gives the patient a choice as to how they want to pay out their bill for the doctor. If they can't pay it all up front, uh, and that'll be true uh, even as people get into this uh, Obamacare, some people will choose to pay their own in, rather than take out insurance. And when they do that, of course, uh, sometimes they don't have the full amount. The doctors need a way for them to pay that out and collect that money from them automatically. This is an automated system for helping the uh, patients to pay those bills to the doctor. Of course, we've already mentioned that doctors waste a lot of time and money doing their billing in-house. Uh, in fact, this is from the uh, another organization that we're a member of, the Medical Group Management Association. And they did a survey just recently and said, what are the biggest challenges of running a group practice? And look at number one, dealing with the rising operating costs. That's where you can come in, folks, to help with that, again, if we can cut that from, uh, say, 24 cents out of every dollar down to uh, 6 or 7% of every dollar uh, spent on billing, uh, that's a savings for the doctor. That's a huge, huge reason why doctors are concerned right now. Uh, some of them pay, uh, as this quote says, up to $57.46 per claim. That's what it costs them right. in their own staff's time and effort behind the scenes 
uh, to collect the money. And, and Patrick, uh, to put that into perspective, a lot of uh, reimbursements can, can be as low as only 60 70 80 dollars right so you, you can imagine that the doctor spending probably anywhere from 60 to 70 percent of a claim just to pay someone to actually do that yeah yeah that, that's eating up all of their profit right there and that's because people don't realize what it really costs a, a doctor in-house to do the billing folks if a doctor is doing uh, you know an average of about 400 claims per month uh, in a year's time, at $100 per claim times 6%, I'm, I'm using that just as a, a number to stab out here, uh, that's that's probably on the low side of what you would charge a doctor. You would earn about $28,800 for doing the doctor's billing. If he does that in-house, look, with his uh, cost for one and a half people to do it, the payroll taxes, the co workers' comp insurance, uh, insurance uh, on errors and omissions insurance, training cost and leave coverage, employee benefits package, all that mounts up, even the hardware and software and IT support to keep up with his own software in his own office costs something each year. That can add up to, to some big dollars there. So look at the savings. It's 48% less expensive for the doctor to outsource to you. So when people ask us that question from time to time, Eric, why would a doctor outsource their billing to you? Well, one is they can save a lot of money. That's, exactly. that's one good reason. And then, you know, right along with that, Patrick, people are also asked, well, what am I going to charge the doctor to do their billing? Well, folks, again, we're going to have to, we're, we're going to show you, but again, even with what uh, Patrick is showing you here on the screen is, even with what you're going to charge that doctor, whether it's 6 7 even 8%, you're going to see these types of savings for that doctor. Uh, and, but you've got to do what we tell you to do with these practice analysis is how we got all this information. Yeah, we, we show you how to gather that information of the doctors and how to price it correctly because we've seen licensees leave money on the table. They haven't exactly. charged enough. And sometimes they overcharge and don't get the client. So, folks, our 20 years experience in this industry helps with that type of thing. We can save you a ton of money and get you a lot more money from the proposals that you make to doctors uh, because, hey, it's, it's big bucks for them savings-wise and why shouldn't you make uh, a decent living uh, doing it for them as well? And then here, when we're talking about claims, we're talking about claims being processed in, in house. Uh, do not get submitted in a timely manner. And what we're talking about here, even though that the doctor is seeing patients directly in their own office, and Patrick's already mentioned earlier about the overwhelmingness of just the the, the staff they're trying to keep up. Well, folks, 29% of claims were received from healthcare providers, and we're talking back to the, the to the insurance companies like the health uh, like Medicare and Blue Cross Blue Shield. Could take up to 30 days after the service was provided. Then 15% of those claims were received for more over than some of them more over 60 days. You know, Patrick, you know, a lot of times, I don't know about you, but if I do some service and I'm going to send out an invoice, I'd like to make sure that that gets paid pretty quickly, not 30 to 60 days out. Yeah. And we, we've seen doctors, of course, get, get paid as, as little as seven days. <coughs> Excuse me. Our, our, claim, our iClaim cloud-based billing system that you'll be utilizing, folks, can get those reimbursements to the doctors in as little as seven days, about an average on average, it's about 14 days on average, but we've seen it as little as seven days. So, boy, you think doctors are not happy with that. Eric, I should change this slide because we just had uh, one of our licensees who comes down and does the training says that she saw her doctor get paid within three days from the wow. time she billed. Yeah, because it was all, you know, uh, sent electronically. To wow. His, uh, Unbelievable. Yeah. And then with these claims that sometimes don't get submitted, when they do get submitted, some of those claims are going to get rejected. And uh, if, you're, if you don't understand what we're talking about a rejected claim, we're talking about a claim that may have some errors in it and it gets sent back to you as a billing company or to back to the doctor. And then 25 to 40 percent of rejected claims are never even resubmitted for another payment. So we're talking about on top of that, folks, what we're showing you here is the where the doctor's money is just getting stopped. When we talk about a cash crunch to a cash flow, this is what we're talking about here. And this is what's driving these doctors literally insane about getting paid. 
you know, Dr. Patrick, I mean, these, these doctors have gone to school. They want to get paid. They want to be independent. They don't want to be employees, but they can't get a hold of their billing. Sometimes they can't get all of that revenue uh, as much as they, they, that they need to. Yeah, absolutely. Well, large numbers of claims are also rejected due to staff errors or outdated software. People ask us, how, how is it that we get our rejection rate down less than 2% when the nationwide average is about 34%? Uh, it's because of our system. Being a cloud-based system and having the built-in error checking that's in our system, we make sure that the claims are scrubbed before they're even submitted. And as you can see, the, a single physician practice can expect an average of 69 rejected claims per month. Well, what if each one of those claims is worth $150? Uh, right. That's uh, almost ten grand a month, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's a lot of that's a lot of change there. Yeah, and there there are a lot of reasons why those claims are rejected, folks. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that the uh, the staff is not trained properly to know how to submit those claims and and what to look for, like you will be. Uh, and of course, they don't have the cloud based system that we have that scrubs those claims before they're actually sent. Here's an actual case study. Uh, we've increased doctors. Uh, uh, bottom line by up to a half a million dollars. This is a, a real licensee who submitted this to us. They had this doctor who was getting 60% of their claims rejected, Eric. Uh, we've actually heard more than that in the past. But right. anyway, uh, when we got it down to 2%, of course, which means a whole lot more money in the doctor's pockets. We increased their revenue by 41%. Folks, there's nothing here to sell. When people ask us, do I have to be a salesperson? Would you have to sell this to any uh, doctor who could see that they could increase their revenue by, uh, you know, half a million dollars? They would be very happy doctors like this one is. That's the best and, I could and, come up with. And, and Patrick, you know, uh, the whole thing about selling there, it, it is this. And, and we're not trying to get you to become salespeople out there. You, there we know that there's a need in, in helping doctors, and you, and, but you can't go out there and try to sell them a system or a piece of software, we will teach you and show you in our live training what to do to do these types of charts that Patrick's been showing you, showing you in collecting this information. And then truly, <coughs> the numbers don't lie. And let let those things convince the doctors that they need to change what they're currently doing. Yeah, and I'm about to talk about uh, codes um, because coding is a big problem for doctors. One of the things they do is undercode their visits, by the way. And if you haven't heard about codes, you can go out and Google this. But uh, there's a thing called the uh, ICD codes, the uh, International Classification of Diseases, uh, which basically the World Health Organization came up with that classifies everything that's you know wrong with the human body. Well, those codes are about to not double, not triple, not quadruple, but be about, what, Eric, 10 times the number of uh, codes that there are now. And there's thousands of them right now. So right. Chad's question was, are we going to, you know, you know, now that they delayed that, that new ICD-10, they call them, codes are not, not coming out until October of uh, 2014. Uh, where are we at in our system as far as enhancements and so forth? Chad, our, well, let me let Eric address that because Eric, you show the demos to the doctors and you've seen those codes already, haven't you? Absolutely. Uh, you know, what you got here on the next screen here is uh, what's called a uh, super bill. And, and, and on that particular super bill are codes. There, there are codes that are called the diagnosis codes, which is what we're talking about there, the ICD-9s, which are going to be going to the ICD-10s uh, here very shortly. And again, the way that our system works, when the, when the doctor properly uses the, the electronic medical records platform, once they are seeing, once they're, once they're seeing that patient, they check out what's going on with that patient, they start to do the physical exam. It doesn't matter if we're dealing with the ICD-9s or the ICD-10 codes or those diagnosis codes. It's the same thing that we're talking about there. The system will actually give the doctor the proper suggested groups of codings for that doctor to choose from. So what this, what it, this is telling everybody on the call today and those that will listen uh, later on it is the fact that the doctors are not going to have to go memorize all a bunch of brand new codes. The system will actually help them do that. Then we've got from Mike from Ing uh, Mike Inger from a via code has stated that the average physician could increase their monthly billing by 
30% if their codes are done correctly or accurately. And, and again, the way that our system works through our EMR system, that electronic medical record system, as they get through with that encounter or that particular visit, again, not only is the code, the, the system going to give the doctor the proper diagnosis codes, Patrick, it's going to also give them the proper procedure code, and that's what's dealing with the doctor's money. And a lot of times here, we've seen a lot of doctors put a code that would give them lesser money than what they should be expecting. And uh, that is where the doctors can lose up to about 30% if they do what is called in the industry under coding. So that's what we're kind of talking about here uh, yeah. and, and, with, your, with this particular and, and those codes that are in our system right now, Chad, back to your question, they are the current codes and the codes that are now being suggested for some of those procedures. So they're all already in our system. And since we have certified medical coders, that, that's their only job behind the scenes is to make sure that our system is updated. You never have to worry about downloading new codes or updating. Every time you log into our cloud-based system, you're seeing the latest codes. And you can even search for them by number. You can search for them by words, uh, keywords. And uh, we even have a service that you can offer to the doctors called CodeWrite that can have those certified medical coders go through his current coding and make sure that they're coding accurately. Uh, that can save the doctor a lot of money and increase their revenue. He gets reports uh, from uh, our CodeWrite system that's actually uh, showing him step by step, and we go over this with the doctor, how that they can increase their revenue by coding accurately, and to be careful that they're not overcoding, uh, so they don't get caught and, and fined by by Medicare for overcoding. It's called so a great great service there. Right. Uh, and here we're we're dealing with doctors about you know, Patrick. This is kind of. Uh, interesting here because one of the things that we talk about as part of our practice analysis is one of the things we're asking the doctors about is do they know the rejection rate and and you know this is interesting that you've got this up here doctors don't know how to decrease their rejection rate and increase their revenue and, and folks what we're showing you here on the screen now with this practice revenue report uh, this tells a lot. This will tell you a lot as a licensee. And again, this is a lot of, of our proprietary information that's on our licensee support site, uh, but you get access to it immediately once you become a licensee. And these are the key elements of what it's going to take for you to get your doctors. Because what you're going to do is learn how to get this information from the doctors, get the number of claims that are filed on a monthly basis, what's that average bill per claim, you put it in the spreadsheet, you put in the number of how much you're going to charge on the percentage, and usually, just about every single time, there's going to be an increased revenue, always double digits there, always double digits. Yeah, this is the type of thing, folks, that makes it uh, something, again, that you don't have to sell. The doctor looks at the bottom line and says, if you can show me how to increase my revenue by $136,000, uh, I'm in. I'm, I'm, I'm at least going to give you a try. You know, if I were a doctor, I would say, okay, let's let's give it a try at least. And then, of course, one of the problems that doctors face is uh, what we call server-based software. That's software that, you know, is shipped to you on a DVD or a CD. You install it onto your computer hard disk, and the computer is running that in the doctor's office. Or if he's outsourced his billing to a company that uses server-based software, there's lots of uh, disadvantages, folks. There's lots of that type of software that's out there that's been around for years and years. Here's a couple of them, three of them. And uh, all of these are softwares that always have the same inherent problems. That is trying to keep these updated. In fact, uh, Dr. Stephen Hacker has written a book that you can pick up at uh, Amazon called The Medical Entrepreneur. And in this book, he says the most significant cost that physicians overlook is the cost of an IT consultant to support the systems in the office. He's talking about server-based software, folks. He says, my fear of losing my patient uh, data was validated one morning when I arrived at the office to find that no one could access any patient data. The best way to minimize this is to use an ASP system. Uh, that is a, a server uh, cloud-based system like we have. 
and and our, here is our uh, claim uh, web-based platform. And the, you know, best, Patrick, one of the best ways to describe this is 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 uh, just basically asking the question to everybody that's on the call and that, that will listen. Uh, have you ever logged into your bank account um, by any? See, this is great because you don't have to load anything from your bank to put it on your system to transmit this data. This is the same type of, of theme that's going on with iClaim, and this gives that doctor direct access to their patients through iClaim, through a web-based system, uh, not a server-based system where that, that patient data is literally residing on that doctor's server or somewhere else, uh, like your, your, your server at your own home, uh, which that could just, uh, you're going to get into HIPAA rules there that you better be completing on all levels there. Yeah, so, so any computer anywhere in the world that's uh, connected to the Internet, you or the doctor can access directly at any time, in real time, the status of the claims. And that means the status of the doctor's money. He can see pie charts showing him exactly who owes him money and when he should be getting his money. And they love this, don't they, Eric? You've given access to some doctors that we've done some research and development with, and they, they just right. go bananas after it. Correct. Yeah. And they can access it from their iPhones. I mean, again, wherever the doctors have can get Internet service, whether it's through their smartphone, because a lot of people ask, well, can it only be getting, gotten through the iPhone? No, it's through any type of Android smartphone type system, uh, whether it's iPhones or the Android systems, uh, you can certainly be able to log in there. And it's beautiful for them. The doctors certainly love that. Yeah, Eric, I'm, I'm skipping just a couple of slides, as you'll see on your notes there probably, but I'm just skipping ahead so we can wrap up here pretty quick. Uh, this is the electronic medical record system, as it shows on a screen when you're using it on uh, a computer or an iPad, which the doctors absolutely love. Uh, it's, it's certified for meaningful use, which means the government is giving money back to the doctors for utilizing EHR, and it's just a wonderful way for the doctors to get uh, into the 20th century, uh, I mean very fast. So, folks, doctors are drowning in paperwork. You can be the person who comes and helps them, not only with their medical billing, but uh, with some of our other services, all of their medical revenue cycle. Uh, this is illustrated here by what you see on the screen. Ask your ABS rep to give you access to our virtual brochure, and you can find out more about that. Uh, we've got some new training webinars coming up uh, this year for our licensees. Part of what you get as an ABS licensee is continual training and education on these types of subjects. So Eric, why don't we go to some of the uh, some of the questions there while we kind of wrap up here. Uh, I'll put up the article that they saw earlier from the magazine that I had published and you can uh, ask your ABS rep for a copy of this when you call in. While we've got the uh, phone number on the screen there, Eric, why don't we just take sure. a few more of those questions? Right, well, I, I want to kind of uh, real quickly go back to uh, a couple of things Chad has said and Chad's it seems like he's very much in the business, and he, you mentioned earlier about the codes, and you know it's close to those those codes that are going to be changing. That's close to about ten times. He says it's roughly going to go from eighteen thousand to one hundred and forty-one thousand codes. So, wow. folks, this is something good that you don't have to worry about. Now, uh, Irene asked this question here, Patrick. What is the likelihood of the doctors purchasing the software for his staff to use in house after the licensee makes their presentation? Oh, well, that, that has happened. Uh, we've had licensees make the presentation to a doctor who wanted to just see what the electronic medical records was all about, and they decided to go ahead and do their billing through the system as well. Well, folks, you as an ABS licensee will make money every month because they have access fees that they'll be paying to access the electronic medical records and the practice management system. And so that's not a bad thing. You don't want to walk away from any uh, money that's out there. So if a doctor has just determined that they are not going to outsource their billing, they want to do it themselves, why not profit from that? All right, Patrick, I, I don't know. We're at up at the four o'clock hour. Do you want to talk real quickly about this upcoming training workshop that we've got here? It is coming up October the 28th through the November the 1st. And really, we're talking about four and a half weeks away here, uh, if not even that, really. So, But yeah. more importantly, folks, we know that we're on the internet. You you hear us over the internet. You you talk to us over the telephone. 
Uh, and I want to give Patrick an opportunity real quickly to address the 100% money back guarantee that we do offer here at American Business Systems. So Patrick, why don't you take just the, the last few minutes here of the hour here and uh, discuss that real quickly. Yeah, folks, let me uh, let me talk to you one on one as if I'm sitting right there beside you. If you were my brother, my sister, my mother, uh, I would tell you the exact same thing that I'm about to tell you. This business is not for everyone. This business is for people who are really seriously committed to working the business. It is an easy business to, to actually work. We, we'll show you how to do everything you need to in this one week with hands on experience right there in the classroom. But folks, if for some reason you decide to come down to our training, you do your due diligence, you send in the paperwork, and you actually pay us the licensing fee, and you sit through this class for a full week and decide that this is not for you, we have in our agreement that you'll sign this word-for-word -word money back guarantee. And it reads like this. If at the end of the training workshop, for any reason, you don't think this business is right for you, Simply tell any staff member and they will arrange for you to receive a full refund of your license fee. Now, when I first came out with this, my staff thought I was crazy because we let you not just go through the first day or the day and a half or two days and then get your money back. You can get your money back at any time during that week. And that means you can go to the end of the week, see every proprietary information that we share during that week. And if for some reason you don't think this is right for you, you simply ask for your money back. Now, I don't know how to be more fair than that. That's the way I would want people to do business with me. And so we do business with people that way. If you're wondering if somebody has asked for their money back, the answer is yes. We have had people ask for their money back. In 20 years, we've had three people during the training workshop actually ask for a refund. Now, every one of those cases was a very personal situation in the lives of that person that decided they had to move on and, and get their money and move on to something else. Uh, a death in the family for one case, another one, a fellow invested and his wife didn't know. And she told him not to come home if he didn't bring the money back. And so there are reasons why people have asked for their money back. And we've given that money back. The point is that this should be a no brainer for you if you're still not sure, even after doing all the research. I know it's confusing to look on the internet at all that's out there and decide whether this business is right. Uh, you have to make that decision at some point to actually come down and see if what we've told you over the phone and through our webinars is really true. And if it is, then you join us. And if it's not, then you get your money back and you move on and uh, we'll still be friends because we don't need your licensing fee. What we need you to be is a successful medical biller because folks, the way I built the business was to base this on uh, not just the upfront licensing fee that you pay, but on the back end, we've made arrangements with all of our technology partners to where ABS makes a few pennies on each one of the transactions that goes through our system. So that assures you that you're going to have our continued attention uh, in helping you be successful because the more successful our licensees are, the more successful we are. Anyway, I thought I'd just share that with you there at the end. Yeah, this is, this class is that. filling up though, isn't it, Eric? It is. It's, it's filling up. I mean, we it, already we're looking at